My name is Peter Whitewood and I'm a PhD student at the School of History at the University of Leeds. And I'm going to talk today about Stalin's Purge of the Red Army, which is an important part of the Great Terror, but one which has not seen a great deal of serious analysis. And this is surprising. During the military purge, over 30,000 officers were discharged from the ranks, executed and arrested. The purge began in June 1937 after a closed military trial sentenced eight senior officers to death, including the world-renowned Marshal Mikhail Tukhachevsky. The men were charged with membership of a military fascist plot, of working with the German fascists and trying to overthrow the Soviet government. The trial quickly led to an expanding series of arrests as more co-conspirators were drawn in, and this soon became a full purge of the entire Red Army. The military purge cost the army dearly, and it certainly contributed to the, the poor performance of the Red Army in the opening years of World War II. Yet the reason why Stalin lashed out at his military in such an extreme manner remains unsolved. What is certain is that there was no real conspiracy within the Red Army. It's long been known that the basis of this military fascist plot was fabricated and carefully crafted by the Soviet political police using forced confessions. Consequently, there's been numerous attempts to explain the military purge from its very aftermath. But even today, there is still no convincing explanation about why Stalin would attack his army on the eve of war. The most common argument sees Stalin subduing his army in 1937 as part of his domination through terror, removing those officers he fought would become a block to his expanding power. But this explanation has numerous flaws. If the consolidation of power were the main objective of the military purge, Stalin picked a terrible time to do this. By 1937, it was clear that world war was on the horizon and Soviet defense spending was rising rapidly in response. Why would Stalin build with one hand and destroy with the other? Why prepare for war, but at the same time weaken the army through a radical purge. Stalin risked weakening his army at the very moment he needed it to be strong, and this potentially put the entire Soviet Union at risk. So on the surface, this military purge appears to be an irrational act, and it does not sit comfortably with an explanation focusing on Stalin's calculated moves to increase his power. In addition, Common to many previous accounts of the military purge is a story about a fabricated dossier of evidence which Stalin supposedly used as a pretext to execute Tukhachevsky and the other officers he wanted out of the way. But from the opening of the Soviet archives in the early 1990s, this dossier has never been found. And the materials that are available today do not point to the existence of such a dossier either. In short, the dossier story has little credibility. And finally, we know much more today about the military purge itself thanks to new materials from the Soviet archives. And there's been a lot of diverse work done and we know a lot more about how the Red Army was affected by the rising political repression in the 1930s. But none of this newer work really explains the reason why Stalin would purge his army in 1937 and typically falls back to an explanation that it was all down to Stalin's desires for more power and control. So I'm now going to talk about my own research and how this explains the military purge and how there is a rationale behind an act which on the surface seems so irrational. In order to explain the military purge, we need to go back to the Red Army's very formation in early 1918 and understand that the Bolshevik party and the political police were very concerned that the Red Army was the target of enemies and counter-revolutionaries. There were numerous perceived threats to the army which evolved and developed all the way into 1937, until the military purge was finally initiated. So the military purge is best seen as the culmination of a long prehistory of perceived threats, which evolved and developed over 20 years. These perceived threats left Stalin with many nagging doubts and lingering suspicions about the loyalty of his army, which by 1937, he could no longer ignore. The reason I describe these threats as perceived is that they were exaggerated. Foreign spies and counter-revolutionaries were frequently discovered in the Red Army, 
from 1918, but the political police also used false confessions. So not all of the arrested were genuine. The political police actively looked for conspirators and beat confessions from the arrested. This had the effect of increasing the perceived scale of the threats to the army. It exaggerated these. But at the same time, Stalin was very receptive to believing these confessions. Stalin believed that a new war with the capitalist world was inevitable and that the final clash between communism and capitalism was certainly going to happen. In this respect, it made sense that the Red Army would be the target of foreign agents and counter-revolutionaries. In all, this meant that Stalin had fewer doubts about the arrests that the political police were bringing and the alleged counter-revolutionary counter groups they were discovering. So there is a difference between the perception and the reality of these threats. And it's how the perceived threats to the Red Army evolved that is the important point. If we look at the long history of perceived threats to the army, we'll see their development and evolution, but also note a couple of key points along the way. So during the 1920s, there were three chief perceived threats to the army. Firstly, the whites, who were the reactionary forces who had fought the Bolsheviks during the Civil War and who were now in exile abroad. Secondly, foreign agents. And thirdly, military specialists. Military specialists were ex-imperial officers from the Tsarist army that the Bolsheviks were forced to use in their own Red Army because of a skill shortage. But many were suspicious about their loyalty and that they may be used as agents by the exiled white forces. All three of these threats were seen as having the ability to infiltrate into the Red Army. This was a case of the enemy within. Also, during the 1920s, there were numerous rumours about the disloyalty of the Red Army High Command itself. At the time, senior officers such as Tukhachevsky uh, were the subject of intense speculation abroad about their disloyalty. Tukhachevsky was often depicted as a Russian Bonaparte who would challenge Stalin and lead a fight against the Bolshevik regime. Of course, these were only rumours. But the political police surely kept a note of all of these. Indeed, the rumours were so strong that the political police used them themselves, spreading disinformation about Tukhachevsky and creating fake counter-revolutionary organisations in order to entrap real white counter-revolutionaries. So in the 1920s, it was, this was a period of intense rumour about disloyalty in the Red Army High Command, of fears of possible infiltration by the whites in exile, by foreign agents, and about betrayals by these military specialists. But again, these were perceived threats, and they were exaggerated. There were was, there was certainly some genuine counter-revolutionaries and foreign agents in the army at this time, but certainly not enough to match the level of concern about army vulnerability. There was one final perceived threat to the army in the 1920s, and this was from the Trotskyist opposition. As Leon Trotsky moved into opposition in the early 1920s, he managed to gain some support from the army, though this was only a small minority. But despite their size, the political police were convinced in 1927 that the Trotskyists were planning a coup and that the Red Army Trotskyists were involved. The political police took countermeasures against the alleged coup attempt, and Stalin praised them for this. But he was certainly less alarmist about the Trotskyist threat to the army than the political police. For example, the head of the political police, Vyacheslav Menzhinsky, wanted to crack down on the Red Army to solve these problems with reliability he saw as a cause of um, Trotskyist agitation. But Stalin argued that the political police were being far too pessimistic. The army was secure and there would be no crackdown. So in 1927, Stalin leans towards restraint. He hesitates. The alleged coup attempt had been foiled and there would be no need for a further crackdown in the army. And this would not be the last time that Stalin would act with restraint against the army. Another example of Stalin's hesitation can be seen in 1930, when a very large military specialist plot was exposed in the army by the political police. And this led to the arrest of over 3,000 military specialists. Importantly, this plot was not genuine. 
it was fabricated by the political police and expanded through forced confessions. Again, the important point to note is that the this was a perceived threat rather than it being a real threat. And in this case, the plot grew out of police fears that the army was under threat from foreign agents and that some military specialists were planning an uprising. But again, these fears had very little basis in reality. And what is interesting about this plot is that some of the incriminations reached directly into the army itself, into the Red Army elite. And so they went far beyond the bulk of the arrests, which are these military specialist outsiders. For example, two of the arrested specialists incriminated Tukhachevsky as being a leader of a rightist conspiracy. Tukhachevsky was then investigated, and Stalin was closely involved with this investigation. But in the end, he was convinced of Tukhachevsky's innocence. Again, Stalin showed a level of restraint. Of course, he could have had Tukhachevsky arrested and drawn into this military specialist plot. But Stalin recognized Tukhachevsky's talent and experience. He needed people like him in the Red Army. And there was little to be gained from having him drawn into a plot on the basis of weak evidence. But Stalin would certainly not forget the very large military specialist conspiracy. He believed the basis of this alleged plot. And he would not forget Tukhachevsky's incrimination, especially as this was a man widely rumored to be a Russian Bonaparte. And even though Stalin had shown restraint, he would be left with many lingering suspicions and nagging doubts about army reliability and the loyalty of his military elite. After the exposure of this military specialist plot in the early 1930s, there were no more mass arrests in the army until the summer of 1937, when the military purge began. However, during this time, the perceived threats to the army continued and some increased in scale, in line with external and internal pressures. So as the international situation worsened in the early 1930s, with Japanese invasion of Manchuria in 1931, and Hitler's rise to power in 1933, the political police recorded an increase in foreign espionage and noted that the army was now the target of counter-revolution more than it had been at any other time. And within the Soviet Union, the political police continued to make arrests for Trotsky's agitation in the army in the early 1930s. And this reflected broader party concerns about hidden Trotskyists. By the mid-1930s, senior party figures such as Nikolai Yezhov who went on to lead the political police, were convinced that the Trotskyists had a hidden center within the Soviet Union and that foreign agents were working inside political Negro circles. At the same time in the 1930s, more rumors began to filter in from abroad, reporting an alleged secret link between the Red Army High Command and the Nazis. These were rumors of a similar kind seen during the 1920s, which had presented the army elite as disloyal. But now a connection was made to Germany. For example, in the 1930s, Tukhachevsky was linked to Hermann Göring. And in 1935, the head of Soviet military intelligence reported a secret connection between the German officers and the Red Army. These rumors about a secret connection with Germany added to the growing mass of rumors about Tukhachevsky and his allies in the army elite. And even though they were only rumors, and they were probably understood as such, for example, they did not lead to any arrests. They would certainly be added to Tukhachevsky's growing police file and would create more suspicions and lingering doubts about the loyalty of those serving at the top of the Red Army. <laughs>